Welcome, everybody. Very good to see you here at the first Health Equity Network webinar. And the theme for today is uh, business and health. And um, we have a, a, a program with um, very high profile speakers in this field. And I'm really looking forward to hearing. Um, it'll be Mickey Alexander who will lead off. And Mickey was the lead author on the uh, Institute of Health Equity Business and Health Report, which came out about 12 months ago. And um, Mickey will speak for 10 minutes, and then we'll have Elizabeth Backrad from Business for Health, who will talk about uh, some recent work that the Business for Health um, organization have been launching, and it'll be really excellent to hear from uh, um, Elizabeth. Then uh, we'll have Sarah Borderley um, from the Department of Health, Health and Equalities Unit, who will be going through a number of slides, particularly looking at the 10 ways approach on working with business. And then, um, Whilst we did flag up that we would have uh, Greg Fell and Ruth Tennant, we've actually just got um, Greg today because Ruth has been called away on some urgent business, but we know that Greg is more than able to uh, deal with these issues and we'll be looking to try to respond to some of the things that um, have been coming up through the previous three speakers. We will then in invite people uh, from the audience to make points, to ask questions, and um, we want to do that. If you could put your hand up on the, the hand facility, because then we will actually, if we've got time, offer it up that you can speak on screen. Because again, as this is a network, we want to enable people to, to make their points. You can also put points if you want to in the chat, and we'll try to monitor that and uh, get back to you that way. Okay, so by way of introduction, um, the, the business and health agenda is, is one that uh, has become more recognisable as a public health theme in the last five, ten years. And in my years in public health, we tended to think of business as the enemy. And often for good reason. Uh, you think of the activities of the tobacco industry, the alcohol industry, um, and maybe food industry nowadays, where a lot of what is being done seems to be acting um, in the opposite direction to where we would want to go for, for health equity and for public health. But we're increasingly recognizing that we actually need to work with businesses, that we need to get the business sector on side in terms of health equity. And that sector is enormous with particularly significant potential in achieving health equity and the draw towards um, and the momentum for health equity. But it's seems to me, for public health practitioners particularly, it, it seems to be fraught with challenges as to how we actually do that. One is, well, how do you actually engage with businesses? And if you looked around the attendance on this webinar today, you'll see there's not many people from the business or social enterprise sector on this call. There's always the question, I think, about the risk of what are you compromising whenever you start working with businesses? And questions about who actually benefits from engagement with public health. But while those may be things that are of concern, it still feels right to me and right through the Health Equity Network, and you'll probably know that we're sponsored by Legal and General in this work, that we actually make those inroads into working with businesses, that there was such a lot to be gained um, from making that partnership work in favour of promoting health equity. So, so that's the, the, the background. Elizabeth, if you're okay to pick it up? All right, so I get the honor of kicking off, which yeah. is always <laughs> exciting and and a challenge. Uh, but this is such a wonderful opportunity to present to you because um, I work for Business for Health, and we are a business-led coalition uh, supporting sustainable investment in long-term preventative health and care. So our purpose is really to motivate and mobilize business investment in workforce health and those impacts to wider community. Uh, and we've had a lot of synergies and alignment with this network, um, in particular, um, Sarah Bordley, who will talk next about the 10 ways through the NHS for businesses to invest in reducing inequalities. But the, the, the alignments with what business really wants and what public health really wants, we are talking about shared value. So this is quite the um, opportunity and platform to showcase how this is possible to achieve both business and health outcomes. Yeah. And 
and it aligns oh, with the Business of Health Equity that's Report that's and, uh, on, on our pillars and scopes, which I'll get into in a moment and share some slides. But I, I think when we want to talk about strategies um, and, and how we do this, uh, we've launched a report uh, this week uh, and highlighting our, our year-long research from two years even on um, our launch with the Business Framework for Health. And it's really highlighting the need for this increased focus on workplace health, long-term prevention strategies to help alleviate pressure on the NHS, but really to also um, improve the wealth of the nation, so to boost the economy. And if we wanna think today about what would really drive the impact for our systemic change, uh, Dame Carol Black, who gave our keynote when we launched on um, our report, talked about really three fundamentals. And I, I think hopefully everybody can align, but we'll love your feedback. Powerful leadership, uh, boards that are engaged and empowered managers. So this looks across the entire value chain. And I will show you now how we think about this. Um, and that also aligns with the Health Equity Network and the report. So I'll share some slides to talk us through how Business for Health is approaching it. Um, and let's go here. Can I, we're okay, Ellen? Thumbs up? Yep, looks great. Okay, so fabulous. So this is our three pillar business framework for health. If you read the report of Business for Health Equity, it aligns closely with the three scopes. Um, looking at workforce health, how do we drive investment and, and look at how business has that influence directly and indirectly on workforce health and well-being, and we extend this to families as well. Consumer health, um, a very hot topic at the moment, as Alan talked about, tobacco, uh, food industries in particular, we're really starting to see uh, food systems and, and businesses in particular driving a lot of the inequalities in, in our health outcomes. So how are we incentivizing business to influence the health outcomes of their consumers through the products and services they sell? Um, and lastly, um, community health business, this reflects business activity. So what's happening within the business and its activity, including their practices and policies that really influences the health of the wider community in which they operate. Now, in order to make any sort of momentum and, and drive investment in workforce health, we want to look at the entire system performance. So what is actually happening with these systems is we see it as impacted by the coupling effect of the interfaces. So what's happening in between and the response to external stimuli, including stressors, uncertainty, cost of living, pandemics, um, the list goes on and really what we want to understand is how we can measure what happens at the those elements of the systems that govern the behavior of those interfaces so that's the chart of work for us is to really drive business in a systematic gathering of evidence and we feel that a brand new measurement framework needs to exist we know we ask a lot of businesses and what they do measure and what's required by government, but we're pushing in the, the need a little bit more and saying, we have to start to measure more of what's driving these health outcomes. So in order to do that, we are um, navigating an, a new research project that will launch our methodologies and help us test our core 10 metrics that we're devising aligns with business progression models. And really what we want to do is anchor this in business's role and their progression and their role in ICP rollouts. Uh, and Sarah will share in a moment, but this also connects and integrates with 10 ways to reduce health inequalities, the core 20 plus five, which I know she'll talk about, so I'm not stealing her thunder, but what, <laughs> the emphasis of this is really to um, highlight the importance of integrated joined up approaches. We all want the same thing. And really our guiding principles are around um, the business community being essential, essential to shape just and equitable societies, promoting narratives around um, language around health and well-being, what that means to improve population health by prioritizing health equity, collective action. We cannot do this alone. We have to work with all of our public-private partnerships and of course harm reduction. So just a few more comments about what the reports will um, until and I'll drop the link in in just a moment is that we're really um, looking to 
launch and test our methodology and metrics, as I mentioned, by these real world evidence projects. So we're heading out into the business community uh, and working with businesses on their priorities and needs and how we can align um, these metrics to help shape what happens next. So this will be happening throughout 2023. Um, what's in it for businesses? Competitive advantage, recruiting and retaining staff, uh, their their growth potential, the, the commercial opportunity, uh, workforce and community resilience, access to new markets, enhanced value chain productivity. So you can see that there's, there's, so, there's such enormous benefits for everybody involved. Uh, as we enter a strategic partnership with the Health Equity Network, which we're very excited about, we'll be looking to um, target some key areas uh, and test out this implementation. Um, lastly, just some highlights around the report is we did some research on the future of workforce design and frontline lower wage workers, especially in retail and hospitality sectors. So those have that been particularly hard hit by the economic climate and factors in what type of uh, recommendations we can have for government to the economic growth. And this largely rests in putting more robust health measures into environmental social governance, ESG frameworks, which we feel will really drive the push uh, to get both investors, businesses, and of course, the whole community health, um, NHS all involved in getting those shared outcomes that we all desire. So I will, um, I'll stop there and hopefully Mickey is back on. Thank you. That's, that's great. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Can I just ask a question while you're, you're up there? Actually? Because through Business for Health, you do actually have a lot of businesses engaged in, in that work. What, what kind of response do you get when you're talking about that, the ESG thing, which I, I you might need to explain what that stands for, and getting health into that, that governance structure? Are, are they, they're open to it or? or yeah, it's a great question. So ESG is environmental social governance, and it's an investment framework uh, that is uh, driving business decision making around their risks and opportunities um, and how they mitigate risk. And so what we see traditionally is that SMEs, for example, don't necessarily sit in this marketplace because they don't have institutional investors always. But the foundations are so strong in how to assess risk how to assess opportunities, and the, the whole framework is motivated to drive um, decision-making around what is being offered, including supply chain. And it goes, it extends all the way beyond to human rights. So we're looking um, at specifics um, according to regulation. But what we see currently in there is occup traditional occupational health. So we're looking at physical risks. Well, we all have uh, programs and policies in place to mitigate physical harm and risk in the workplace, um, safety, for example. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't have the psychosocial risk assessment that we desperately need. And that's really uh, touching on the wider determinants of health. So we feel that while businesses are slowly starting to understand what that means and protecting mental health in the workplace, for example, looking at MSK as well, that these, these highest risk claims, MSK and mental health, there has to be something different done in measuring, but also mitigating those risks. Um, and so businesses are clearly open to it because they want to have something that's a bit more standard. They want to understand that actually what they might already be doing is helping in that measurement framework, but without capturing it, without reporting on it, without disclosing it, without disaggregating that data to understand what's truly happening in the workplace, decisions are not being made to help progress and close those health equity gaps. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for getting this uh, started as well. Um, so uh, what I'll do, uh, sorry for keeping you on tension, Sarah, but uh, now that we've got Mickey back in the uh, meeting, uh, we'll go to, to Mickey, if you're ready to pick up uh, with slide sharing and talking about the IHE report, Mickey. I am. Um, uh, apologies for the uh, minor technical problems, but I'm back now. Um, I will attempt to share slides but we'll see whether that uh, is more is more problems than it's worth um and also i appreciate that uh i think a lot of our speakers alan and elizabeth already have said similar things to what i might be going on to say um so i will try to stick to uh slightly different elements and perhaps um some difficulties so to introduce myself uh, i'm uh, michael alexander or mickey uh eva's fine 
Um, and despite what it says, I think at the bottom of the screen, I don't actually work at uh, St Helens and, and Nosley um, due to the complicated hierarchy of the NHS. St Helens and Nosley signed my paychecks, but I work uh, as a public health registrar in Blackpool. And before that, I worked at the Institute of Health Equity, um, where I wrote with, with Smipel and, and others. Um, the Marmot Review for Industry, I think, is what we ended up calling it. Um, or the Marmot Business Review for Industry or something along those lines. Uh, I will say that I, I do know that uh, this report is being discussed in St. Helens because a colleague from there uh, just just told me that they had a discussion group around this report. So it's, it that's was gratifying. So I know occasionally it's being picked up. It doesn't really look like my slide sharing is working unless it's working for you and I can't see it. It's working for us. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Well, that's uh, that's fine. So uh, just very quickly uh, to talk uh, a little about the background of where we were when we were writing this report. Um, this is a graph that uh, many of you will have seen before. And if you haven't seen it, you've probably seen very similar ones. Uh, this is a, a life expectancy against deprivation. As you can see, we've got about 10 years difference for both men and women. And as, uh, as I'm sure will come as no surprise to anyone, a healthy life expectancy, the, the distinction is even greater. It's closer to 20 years. So this is the kind of inequality that we are facing, uh, and we knew it was going also in the wrong direction. Um, so in some ways, the motivation, uh, as Alan was saying, the traditional, arguably sort of uh, health inequality view of business, uh, of commercial determinants of health is, is in an almost exclusively negative light and encouraging uh, in, in sort of you know, alcohol, cigarettes, gambling, etc. Um, and to some extent, what shook us out of that bit was, uh, you know, traditionally, we might have tried to um, get action on local or national government. This is national government's results. And I think we know that local government uh, are struggling enormously with uh, having with, with financing. Um, luckily, since since then, uh, we've had several different governments. And of course, things have got um, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for worse. So, uh, you know, as we, this is this has to come anything anytime the Institute of Health actually talks about anything they have to talk about proportionate universalism. In other words, that we want to make sure uh, that we are addressing the inequalities all along the scale and not just the very worst off. Uh, and that's how we get it done. So, and this is simply uh, showing government cuts um, doing the exact opposite of that. Cuts falling hardest on those already most deprived, which again comes as little surprise to many people uh, here uh, and regionally. Um, so these graphs are slightly complicated, but uh, in summary, that what these show is that while being more deprived uh, matters uh, enormously for your life expectancy, um, it matters uh, even where you live matters enormously if you are in those most deprived groups. If you're not, the, the gap is less. So we came around. Uh, so. What we are trying to do is to think a bit more holistically about the ways in which uh, business shape health, and that's through the social determinants of health. So slightly when, you know, things that uh, those in, in working in health, working in public health uh, might find relatively intuitive by this point, the idea that the majority of what determines your health is not health care or even access to health care. It is housing, employment income um etc cetera, etc cetera. those things i think you know when, when you're talking to uh, people in the business world you're still slightly pushing uh, this idea that perhaps for example if they want to improve the health of their um workers that simply increasing pay is more likely to have a a good effect than introducing uh, a health check at work or a mental health scheme potentially so we're trying to bring those worlds together of, of health equity <coughs> and the social determinants uh, together with with the business world. Now, we did a lot of this work in partnership with the legal and general who are uh, a pension fund. And uh, to throw one problem in already, I will say that uh, we try to argue that um, that there is a, a an enlightened self-interest argument for business, um, not solely that, but that um, as Elizabeth has already mentioned, there are definite advantages to a business. Now, I think I think it's fair to say, and I think uh, our friends at Legal and General would agree that that argument is easier to make to a large uh, institutional investor like Legal and General, who've been around for a hundred years and want to be around for a hundred years more. Um, they benefit from 
their reputation. They benefit from um, essentially society not collapsing in flames. Um, however, there may be other businesses whose self-interest at least is relatively short term, you know, who may even be businesses, you know, brought together for a particular purpose, uh, you know, a, a limited liability company or something formed for a particular deal, who to whom the reputational gain is not so obvious, for whom, um, frankly, concern for society is, is not as clear. So that's one of the problems I've thrown there is that there are definitely businesses, both local and big businesses like LNG, but where it aligns with what they're trying to do, as well as aligning, I think, with, with the most. So I think one important thing is that we don't abandon the, the moral argument as well. And again, we've found that people are quite receptive to that. Our framework looks very similar to the Business for Health framework. We didn't steal it. They didn't steal it from us. I think this is a very natural way to think about the impact of business on health. Um, and that's to think about who it's impacting. So we broke it down by employees, clients and customers uh, and communities. For employees, again, a lot of the most basic things, pay benefits, conditions and hours. Um, as Elizabeth was talking about, that's not just um, safe working um, to protect your back, but also uh, fair working to protect your your mental health. And, uh, you know, so Michael, uh, many, many years ago, worked um, on, on uh, the landmark Whitehall studies showing that massively unequal power dynamics in in um, in workplaces may be bad for you in themselves. Um, so it is that sort of psychosocially supportive uh, uh, business, as well as, you know, quite simply, you know, putting up railings so people don't fall over, although that is very important. Um, and then, of course, clients and customers, as we talked about, um, you know, talking about uh, the food industry, for example, um, who have an enormous influence on what's made available. And often, so one other thing that we heard, uh, which again, I'd throw out there as, as an interesting point, is that businesses themselves are not always against uh, good, well-written regulation. Uh, essentially, if you're in heightened competition with someone uh, and they do something they undercut you in some way or other. You you are required to, uh, in order to service your shareholders, you're going to have to do the same. So if they're upping the sugar content or increasing the impulse buys, you're you're probably going to have to do the same. Clear regulation that makes a level playing field for everyone is often actually quite appealing, uh, especially to established businesses. But again, we're getting into the the perhaps difficulties about. Um, the, the different interests of businesses. And then we talk uh, about their influence on communities through their sort of wider influences. Uh, we talk about things like being an anchor institution, which again has come out of the sort of public sector area, um, but we're trying to apply to the private sector as well. Um, you know, especially when they're very, when they're local businesses uh, and having that impact locally. Again, I could talk about all of this for an extremely long time, but I feel like I'm probably nearing uh, uh, enough time uh, so essentially, our argument is that is, is as as Business Health pointed out that, the, that this can be of benefit uh, to businesses, um, but that also uh, we we don't want to give up on the the equity argument. Um, and I think at least some businesses have been very receptive to that. I'm more interested in hearing people's challenges and discussion anyway. So I think rather than kill you all with slides, I will I will leave it there. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, Mickey. The timing was just right. And um, you reminded me there that uh, I think when I talk about business for health, I tend to drift into the idea that it's, it's a homogenous thing that we're talking about. That's the business sector, which is a bit like legal in general, uh, you know, across the board. And of course, it's not. And where I work in, in the Northwest, uh, employers in some of the, the poorest Brothers in the country are mainly um, small and medium-sized businesses mm. who may not have that kind of longevity that you that you mentioned that enables to, to think more in a egalitarian way, but also just may not have the facility to respond to our requests to engage in health equity work. So yeah. thank you for reminding us of that 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 point. Um, and also just that notion that while well, we're looking to work with businesses and see the great potential in it, we don't want to give up the on the health equity challenge uh, that, that um, has always been with us, but we want to make sure we retain that when we work with business. Um, that's excellent. Thanks very much, Mickey. Um, 
Tara, are you ready to pick up? And please do introduce yourself to begin with. Yeah, thank you. And an advantage of hearing what others got to say, you get to kind of adapt yours, which is good, which is actually just sticking in some numbers about business. I've just done that for everybody building on that exact point, which I'll share in a moment. So I'm Sarah Bordley and I'm a qualities and health inequalities lead in NHS England. And I've been working on kind of the role of the NHS in contributing to the social determinants of health and social and economic development and social value for sort of, well, intensely for the last three years, but on and off for about 10 years. Um, and have uh, most recently been leading the work on the NHS role as an anchor. We have within the healthcare inequalities improvement team, though, been starting to think about how we work and influence business and potentially um, sort of work in partnership, particularly with businesses that are in the health and tech industry, but more broadly with all businesses. And I'm just here to share a little bit of the thinking that we, we've been taking and I suppose a practical approach that's building on everything that you've already heard today. So I'm going to take you through where we're up to with our thinking and, and work. But as um, Mickey said, really actually keen to hear from you and your thoughts on and how we progress this work given the interest across different kind of organisations and with yourselves today. So we're all kind of trying to align what we do. But as I said, I just hope. Oh. No, you can help if I shared my screen there. That's not why I meant yeah. to share. Oh. <laughs> I meant to share um, the um, power. It is a live thing. Um, have another go. It'll get there. Yeah, I'll, it'll come up now. I'm doing it. What I've just done because you were the conversation about um, business and types of business. I have just um, stuck in um, some figures here, which you probably can't see. And I actually can't see because my screen's so small now. But um, my memory is that actually there is, most people are employed in SMEs, but there are a lot of people, you know, there are a, a smaller number of large business, but they employ a lot of people as well. I can't read the table myself, so hopefully you can. Um, but we, we need to really think about um, large and small businesses. So I, I just suppose I just want to set the scene a little bit first on what we see some of the priorities. This is not the focus of today, but I think it's helpful for as I, I progress through um, what I'm going to talk about is what we consider in NHS England priorities for health care. And I think that's quite an important distinction, the distinction between healthcare priorities and health priorities. But this will sort of help set the scene and, and is applicable to both. So within NHS England, we are trying to ensure that there's um, exceptional quality healthcare for all through equitable access, excellent experience and optimal outcomes. And we are focusing that on a number of core priorities, five key, key priorities. And they're on the left, I'm not going to read them all out, but I think um, some of them are really pertinent to what, how we can link with business. So digital inclusion, accelerating prevention, although we have a role, where can business play a role? And also something around strengthening our leadership. And interestingly, just hearing what people were saying around kind of ESG, environmental, social and governance is when I started on this journey, I've worked in the private sector, I, I actually thought the NHS has a lot to learn from business because they have such developed ESG systems in many businesses, particularly large businesses and corporate social responsibility businesses, corporate social responsibility approaches. And I still think we've got a lot to learn from that on this journey. But I think as we're hearing today, we've got a lot we can influence business on as well. The other approach to our priorities are through something called Core 20 plus 5, and this is which some of you may be familiar with. And this is where we're trying to target tackling health inequalities on certain population groups and in cert around certain conditions to really get traction, focus and impact on a number of areas. And I think it's the Core 20 plus that's really interesting here, as well as the five, is we are trying to focus on the 20% of the population that experience the most inequalities and the plus um, 
our, our communities that may not be affected by deprivation, but are affected in other ways, either through um, being homeless or having a learning disability or being from a minority ethnic group. And that might be very relevant and local to a given place. And as I said, we're focusing around the number of core um, conditions, which I think is also relevant as we, we move on. But I, I won't go into those now, but the link that I've got can, can take into those. Of course, healthcare is only part of the picture and we recognise we've got a role, the NHS has got a role in tackling inequalities in healthcare. And then, as we've already heard, there's a lot of social determinants of health, and I'm sure most people on this call are aware of what those are, so I'm not going to go into those. And then we also have a role a bit in the middle where the NHS actually can contribute um, positively to the social determinants of health through our role as an anchor organisation and partner in place. However, we have a key opportunity to work in partnership with others, whether that be at a national or a system level or at an organisational level. And of course, those partnerships could be with communities, local authorities pub and other public bodies, voluntary sector organisations and indeed business. And we taken a bit of a kind of practical approach, which I'm going to come to um, in a moment on thinking about what is the role of business. And I think, first of all, I've heard twice today that kind of business have been traditionally seen as the enemy. Um, and I, I, in terms of they might be pushing unhealthy lifestyles on us, I think there's also it's really important for us to recognise the importance of a strong inclusive economy and only yesterday we saw the reports um, come out from the IPR, IPPR around the, the sort of links between health and economy which I'm sure you're all really familiar with that good health needs a strong economy supports a strong economy and a strong economy supports good health and I of course mean an inclusive economy there so I think we we have to instantly kind of recognise that role and that we know being in good employment instantly supports your health outcomes rather than being unemployed. So recognise that basic role of business. Then I think there's something about what business do and how they do it. So we've heard today about, you know, if you're selling tobacco, clearly an unhealthy thing. If you're selling unhealthy food, clearly unhealthy. But actually what businesses do can drive good health and good health behaviours and also how they do their business um, and, and Mickey and um, uh, Elizabeth have already touched upon some of that. So I think they have a direct role in what they do working by themselves and I think we'll hear that there are plenty of opportunities for them to work in partnership with the NHS or other bodies. So in historically I think a lot of corporate social responsibility programs have maybe um, tried to benefit communities but have not maybe not really focused on priorities and targets or worked with other organisations to kind of I suppose two and two plus four and really get the the benefits of working in partnership and I think that can really support innovation and drive change. What's our role in this? Um, well I've already highlighted I think we're not a business, the NHS, but we do also have a big impact on the economy as the largest employer um, in England. So I, I suppose we need to take responsibility for our own actions as well. But I think our role here is to influence and try and influence business and try and align what they're going to do with tackling some health priorities. And as a member of the health inequalities team, I would say we're focusing in even further into reducing health inequalities. Um, so the big picture of health and well-being for all, but really trying to focus in on a number of areas. And again, we've got an opportunity to work in partnership and benefit from working with business. And there are plenty of um, examples from that, whether it's local service sort of encouraging and enabling people to access services all the way through to um, how do we work with large employers, for example, on tackling diabetes in the workforce. And I think that can lead to a lot of innovation. So last year, um, the director of our team, Dr. Bolo Awalabi, held a roundtable with a number of um, businesses 
And as a result of that, we have identified um, 10 ways that businesses can help reduce health inequalities. And that takes um, through a number of operational areas, through how they are as an employer, how, how they procure and spend their money, how they um, impact on the environment, but also areas around their products and services, how are they designing those, and all the way through to kind of the CSR and ESG and strategy elements. And I, it's probably quite hard for you to read that detail, but I will pop a link into the chat. We are in the process of um, refining these, so they will be updated just to say that now. But I suppose the point I'm really trying to make is, is we're not, uh, everything that Elizabeth and Mickey says is absolutely right, and we're not trying to change that. And a lot of businesses are already doing, trying to think about things through their ESG programmes. And as Mickey and Elizabeth have already said, there's kind of these sort of three pillar approach that you can look at to support health and well-being for everyone. And what I suppose I'm trying to suggest today is that that could be focused further down through perhaps um, directing action, particularly for populations that are in the core 20 plus five cohort. So those that really experience deprivation or, or other inequalities. So how are businesses really thinking about those population groups in their activities? And also, how are they working to address local, national or local priorities? And this is where I think the partnership piece is really important. Um, is is a, a business really thinking about how it can support the 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 needs of that place or the communities around it and again you've got about so, a minute uh, okay so just kind of to wrap up then and then obviously we're driving that through we're suggesting that can be done through uh, a number of different activities which leads to kind of improved health equity economy and prosperity which as mickey says there are kind of moral and business arguments for that so the next steps that we're trying to do is we'll be reviewing those 10 ways and refining them further. And we're also going to be um, under each priority, each way kind of bullet pointing a little bit, trying to define that a bit further so businesses can use that as a tool to think about how can they target what they're already doing to reduce health inequalities more. And an example that I've just put up is something we did um, earlier this year on estates and health inequalities, where we've identified um, opportunities for NHS estates, and we've broken that down into a number of areas. We're also in the process of collating some examples of practice to inspire business and indeed other partners. And we will be sharing this through sort of business networks, trying to go where business go, hearing your comments on there's not that many business partners on the call at the moment. And also, obviously, um, thinking and working with um, systems and integrated care partnerships and trust to sort of get them thinking about working with business as well. So really keen to hear your thoughts on this approach. Any examples? What's our role? What's other people's roles and, and opportunities moving forward? Excellent. That's great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, rather than, than me uh, comment on, on, on what you're saying, uh, I'll just flag up uh, before we go to Greg that, that there's a couple of questions come through, Sarah, um, particularly for yourself. Um, what I'll do after we've heard from Greg is then bring you back to respond to those questions and invite Veronica actually to, to say on uh, screen if she wants to, to reiterate the question rather than me read it out. Um, but if you'd uh, hold on till we come back on to, on to uh, after we've heard from Greg and then we'll uh, get into the question. Uh, Greg, uh, would you like to, to pick up and, on what you've heard so far? Cool. Thanks, Alan. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Greg Fell. I'm Vice President of the Association of Directors of Public Health and in my spare time, DPH in Sheffield, or in the unlikely event, my boss is on the call the other way around. Um, so um, a few thoughts. I'm the bloke that goes last. I have to listen to what everybody said and then try and try and make something up um, so by way of reflections, which I will do. Um, business is good for health. Um, work is good for health. Uh, that's that's a, that's a given, um, uh, and arguably there's some evidence that that's more important. Work is more important than alleviating poverty and income for health. And I'm beginning to see some evidence on that. Look at the Cipher collaboration in particular, um, um, uh, and the evidence is kind of 
there is a given, even the woke snowflakes at the IFS, the Financial Times and The Economist are writing about this stuff now. So it's a given. That's pivoted quite a lot, actually, in the last few years. You read five years ago, it was all about skills and transport and stuff. Now it's not. It is about those things. Those things still do matter. Um, but 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 health matters to UK PLC and vice versa. So it's a symbiotic thing between between two. And a few few of the speakers have, have picked up on that. Um, one thing that nobody's much mentioned yet, which kind of is uh, tangential but kind of important to health and UK PLC, is childcare. Childcare sector is about to collapse. When that collapses, we're all stuffed because uh, who's going to look after our young kids, etc. So uh, we should not forget some of the other stuff. There are multiple ways to cut it, and you've heard about some of that stuff. Um, I could cut it in any number of different ways. The sort of the basic business of population health, keeping people well for as long, well and healthy for as long as possible, uh, regardless of employment status. Some of that's going to be working age, some of that's not going to be working age. For me, I call that public health, or the folk call that population health. I don't care. We can split the difference. Something about people who are in employment. Um, um, so um, certain health and safety regs, as someone picked up, does a lot of the heavy lifting there. Oki Health, where employers have got it. Um, and, and Oki Health practitioners do an awful lot around mental health as well. Um, care on approach. Um, it's easy to say we'll sort out mental health, but we'll offer everybody mental health first aid and we'll put a mental health whiteboard up, but not address fair pay and toxic bullying. And I've seen plenty of employers who, who do the easy stuff, but not the really, really difficult stuff. Um, so, uh, but, 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 you know, keeping people who are in employment well matters. Good jobs, fair work agenda, I should say, is a given pay, skills, development, employment rights, gig, of, gig economy, lack of safeguards. That's the fair work charter territory and lots of writing on that. If you've not read it, the Public Health Scotland report of last year was brilliant. On, uh, on the good work agenda, and I'll find the link and put it in the chat. Um, something about those who are potentially in employment or, or on the labour market, but ill. That's Oki Health, reablement, rehab, IPS type of territory. The work health trials, which were run in South Yorkshire and West Midlands, are a particularly important example of that. Um, but how do we mainstream some of the learning from the work health trials into the big business that is the NHS and DWP, the benefit system? So there's some there's some work to do in that space. Um, the cohort falling out of work because they're poorly and knackered. Um, see particularly the ONS commentary recently. Um, and this kind of plays into healthy ageing agenda. How do we keep people reskilled, second careers, adaptions, adjustments, all of that kind of stuff to keep those who want to work in work for as long as as long as they wish to be in work. Um, and then for, lastly, the, the last bucket for me is sort of focusing on the vulnerable cohorts. This is a health equity network and focusing on the vulnerable cohorts that the labour market largely ignores, to be honest. Um, those with the learning of physical disability, ex-offenders, those who are homeless, root out substance misuse, care leavers, etc. There's loads and loads and loads and loads of really good work going on in those spaces and harnessing it all together, I think, uh, is is uh, is worth a, worth, worth a thought. Um, and, and, and as Sarah mentioned, capitalising on the role of anchor institutions, yes, most are in small and medium businesses, but an enormous number are in big anchor institutions. So for me in the NHS in Sheffield, Sheffield Teaching Hospital employs 18,000 people. It's big, big business. Um, the social care business is 17,000 people in Sheffield, uh, largely Sheffield-based businesses. A um, lot of great work going on in that space, hiring, supported employment, really, really getting into local economy, uh, local procurement and childcare, as I mentioned. For me, there's some tricky space in coordinating all of that. Lots and lots and lots of interest, lots of constituencies that don't actually hang together terribly coherently. So co coordinating that is quite tricky and it doesn't hang together that well. It, there's no single constituency. So for me, the takeaways from all I've heard is it matters. You wouldn't be on the call if you didn't think it mattered. The narrative is shifting enormously, actually, um, and there's plenty of really, really good evidence in that space. The what to do is split across a number of buckets. And the thing that brings it all together is our investment and our commitment to human capital. That's as important as built capital. Um, and we should invest in it that way and think of a similar timescale. It's easy to say rather than do. Um, I'll end where a number of people of uh, a number of people have talked, a fair few have talked about commercial determinants of health. You really don't want to get me started on that. 
um, worth looking out for the World Health Organization Commission when they publish it. Then we're definitely worth reading the Lancet Commission if you've not read it yet. Um, World Health Organization are probably going to give a more than a passing nod to the positive as well as the negative. You'll expect them to talk, talk about the negative, but they'll also talk about the positive as well. But last point from me, um, we talk about non-communicable disease, the methods and tactics used by the tobacco, the alcohol, the gambling, the fast food industry, they're at the heart of this. Um, uh, and any conversation about business and health has to really, really, really very directly address that. Uh, and I'll leave you with a final uh, uh, ask that if you want to get into that space, go read the Lancet Commission because it's brill. I'll stop there, Alan. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Craig. There was such a lot there. I love that very positive comment, but the narrative shifting towards human capital, yeah. I, I think excellent point. And there was so much else to pick up on there, but given that we're, we're done in the last 10 minutes, what I'll, I'll, I'll do is invite people to uh, raise their hands if they want to, to, to make a, a question or a comment. But I'll, I'll go to uh, one first, which is uh, Veronica. You posted a question for Sarah. Do you want to come on screen to, um, to make the point or I can read it out? I can do that if that's OK. Hi, everyone. Go ahead. Thank you so much to all the speakers. It's been really interesting um, listening to all your perspectives on health and business. Um, I had a question, I guess, for Sarah. As a GP working in the NHS, um, my question is really around how the NHS, because I do see the NHS as a business, even though perhaps you don't, I see it as a large business um, with probably competing interests uh, within it, and that probably makes it more complicated. However, it does have responsibility to its employees and as a consequence also to wider communities that it serves. So my question is how does the NHS plan to lead the way um, in the three pillars as Elizabeth mentioned, so with its responsibilities to employees and improving their health and well-being and as a consequence then enabling their function to the community. Um, because I've seen from the 10, I think the 10 uh, I don't know if 10 points or whatever it was at the, at the time, where there's a lot of advice for business, but I'm not seeing feedback going the other way. Can, can there be something that can be learned from businesses that then can be incorporated into what the NHS does rather than the NHS maybe advising business on what they should be doing and maybe opening up that conversation a bit more? So yeah, that was just my question as how the NHS is looking at that area. Thanks very thanks. much, Veronica. Sarah. Th thanks, Veronica. And I, 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 I'm not going to kind of say I've got the solution to making the NHS workforce healthier, um, because it, you know, at all deny that there is a, a huge issue. So I think I did start off by absolutely recognising we have a lot to learn from from business and and and. It, in how we operate for sure and I also tried to sort of recognise the role of the NHS as the largest employer and as an anchor because we we I, I'm not sort of absolutely recognise we've got that role and I, I suppose I also want to say we are definitely not when, when I started to work on this area I was like it's not our role to tell businesses we can learn a lot from them but we're just trying to hear say influence in terms of um here are some areas if they're going to do activities that they could focus on and i think we need to get our own house in order which is what i think you're mainly alluding to and i think that is a big shit to turn so we do the commitment of the nhs as an anchor institution itself is in the long-term plan and we have been sort of investing quite a lot of time and energy to get the nhs better at, in in across its um, areas as an employer, how we use our land and buildings, how we spend our money, and there are numerous initiatives underway in terms of so in London now the NHS most NHS trusts have committed to being a living wage employer, and there are kind of working in in partnerships get more inclusive employment, and in terms of also recognising that our own workforce are the community we, that we serve. We, it's not separate. And we know that in pockets of our own workforce, so if we think about our estates workforce or facilities workforce, probably the, the sort of lowest paid workforce um, within the NHS and our supply chains, that's actually where there is the most ill health and the most in inequalities. So I don't really have that answer for you. I'm not going to 
there is a new workforce strategy being produced at the moment and I have just personally contributed to it and put in those very comments around health, our own staff health and well-being and health inequalities within the workforce. Um, and obviously, I'm sure each individual NHS organisation has got its own commitments that they're trying to make. But I, I think it's a huge issue, health and well-being in, in staff. You know, you only have to read the news every day to find some of those issues out. But I, I'm not going to sort of fudge, a, fudge an answer because I think it's a, it's a beyond my my ability to change that other than mm -hmm. recognise it. And we need to get our own house in order. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Sarah, and, and very good point, uh, Veronica. Um, I'll go straight to Beatrice. Well, thank you all very much. It's been very, very interesting indeed. And um, Greg, as public health director, I think the roles of public health directors across this conversation are absolutely critical if they're allowed to express their voices and get the support that they need to get on with doing it. Uh, and we know that's not necessarily the case. I work across regeneration and I also am a non-exec in the NHS. And um, one of the comments I'd just like to put back to you or, or as a question is the fact that our um, potential employees and existing employees in generational terms um, have different requirements and expectations now, particularly post-COVID. So that one of the points that I think we aren't yet familiar enough in general about is how to help an employee recognise to be a good employee. So they can attract the um, employees that they require to retain. At a point we are at the moment where, in fact, it's quite difficult to fill and complete your workforce across all sectors. It's really triggering um, a point of interactive conversation with an employer to say, do you actually understand why you're not getting the quality of applicant? Why your, uh, your applicant is choosing not to work for you or not to stay with you? Um, and that's because, first of all, you may not be asking in the NHS, um, our real asset potentially around this is our workforce um, survey, our staff survey. Is it reflective enough of this type of conversation anyway? Reputational drawing across in communities into local employment potential. People have a choice um, now. Uh, the employer isn't the, um, hasn't got the capacity and strength they used to have. And I think there's an absolute point in time at the moment where that conversation of linking um, gain gain for everybody is very different. And I know from my regeneration work, which sits across all scales of employers, one of the constants is that in all we don't know how to give the right support now. We don't know where to go for those resources around the fact that our employees, however many, may choose to want to work in a very different way virtually in the office, all of that part of it, childcare, absolutely. But what do we need to do as employers in our individual relationships to give that emotional and practical support? Thanks. Retaining staff is so expensive if you have to replace somebody that the costs of that then start to change as well. Just Thanks very much. Comments. Yeah. That's great. Just, would anyone from the panel like to come back on? that point about the, how we help employers recognise to be a good employee, employer. I'll have a go. Go on, Greg. Uh, so I'll, I'll be quick because I'm conscious of time. Um, so thank you, Agree. Um, uh, and on the voice thing, I've yet to find myself puzzled. There's a point about when to shout, when to whisper and who to shout and whisper at and in what context. But uh, but we use our voice fa fa fairly skillfully, sometimes quietly. Um, on the specifics of the question, sort of adapt, listen and adapt in short, um, because the nature of the labour market is changing really quite fundamentally. And if uh, any employer is kind of fixed and rigid, then they'll find themselves at a competitive disadvantage. So uh, l listen 
um, uh, child care, pay, social contract terms and conditions. We know it's a particular issue in social care. Um, all of our Domi care workers now go work for Lidl or Amazon uh, where they get paid more and they've got much better terms and conditions. So um, if we don't do that, then we'll find ourselves we can't recruit and therefore we won't be able to run any form of business or service. So, But, but at the heart of it is listening and adapting. I'll stop. Excellent. Thanks very much, Greg. We're going to have one last question. Helen, Helen Jim. And Helen, if you could be fairly quick as well. Yeah, happy to be really quick. Um, and I did post into the chat as well in case I dropped off the call. So um, I've got a little bit to say around doing the same things and expecting different outcomes. So spending the same money again and again and again um, and not really paying attention to, you know, what we're getting for our money. Um, and it, I will niche it right down into weight management services because that's our focus about working weight neutrally. And I think that a certain part of our workforce are perhaps conflicted when it comes, you know, to speaking about um, weight um, and improving health behaviours with, um, you know, um, patients and clients. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I've got a question to ask other than to sort of like... Um, agree with a lot of what Sarah and Beatrice is saying there about, you know, looking after our workforce and um, yeah. So I, I put, a, if you like, a little pitch in the chat um, and we're really interested to speak to others because we want to really establish weight stigma as perhaps um, one of the main influences of, of health inequities, you know, because if you look at the 68% of high weight people that aren't accessing services, that 68% of um, all the protected characteristics and the health groups that the core 20 plus five are looking at. So it's, yeah, I'm asking people to come and have a, a different view of what we're contributing as a service um, towards health disparities through weight management programmes. Excellent. Thanks very much, Helen. Thanks for being succinct there. Would anyone like to come back with one final comment from the panel? And if not, then thank you very much, everyone. We were never going to solve the whole issue about um, how we work together on business and health. But I'm really grateful to the panelists for speaking today. Thank you so much for doing that. Thanks also to Alison Beedron, who didn't get a chance to introduce herself earlier, but is the Health Equity Network coordinator. And thank you very much for all the contributions in the chat as well. We will follow up with the speakers to make these slides available to everyone who was registered. And we would very much um, hope that you will engage with us again on the next webinar. And we're also going to be posting soon about the Health Equity Network Annual Conference coming up on the 5th of October. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good bank holiday weekend and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks a lot. <laughs>